We're going to look at Octavio Paz's essay today, um, Mexico and the U.S. Just, of course, it's on your website, but just so you know, it's anthologized now in this new edition of The Labyrinth of Solitude, which is Octavio Paz's very famous and very influential collection of essays. Published in 1950, the first version, this is The Labyrinth of Solitude and Other Essays. Our essay that we're reading today uh, was published in The New Yorker first in English in 1979. And we're going to see some of the 19, traces of 1979. This is already an old essay, if you want. But what I want to do today is walk through it and really go very closely into the text, read together some of the what I consider to be very beautiful passages, very beautifully translated by Rachel Phillips, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I'm not. Yeah, she was Rachel Phillips then. She must have gotten married since she's Rachel Phillips Balash or Belash. It's, it's nicely translated, I think. In, there is a new edition in Spanish, if any of you wants to read the essay in Spanish, uh, in the same format, the, lab, the labyrinth of El Labirinto de la Soledad, and then extra essays that came after it. Octavio Paz died in something like 93, 94, 1994. He won the Nobel Prize as the edition, I believe, as this edition. I, no, it doesn't. I must have bought it before. Something like 1991. I should have looked that up to make sure. Um, a very influential writer. Essays and poetry and plays, never novels, a few short stories, but it's his essays that have taught me a great deal about Mexican reality and about the relation of Mexico to the U.S., which as a U.S. resident and a U.S. scholar, I, I need to know about. I'm going to interrupt myself one second here to just wave next week's books at you. I brought in my three copies of the trilogy. You may be buying them in this form. You be, may be buying them in the, select, the collected trilogy. The, all of this, I hope, is clear on your, uh, your syllabus. But what I want you to do for next week is read this volume, this first volume. You're going to be pleasantly surprised that there's quite a lot of blank space <laughs> because, as I've said, there are very short passages at times that are um, nicely summarized events or people or situations. This covers the first two centuries. Well, it covers before time. You'll see the early passages have no date, no place. They're indigenous myths. They're timeless, if you want. And then you'll get into the history, and that goes on for 30 pages or so, and then the dates start in 1492. At the end of every passage, you'll see I mark up my copy a lot, I hope you do too, um, there is a number or a series of numbers. These numbers refer to a bibliography in the back of the book that says where he got the historical information that he has fictionalized. So pay attention to the, those numbers at the bottom. When you're interested in a topic, go and say, hmm, I wonder where he got this material. Lots of it's going to be in Spanish. So those of you who, aren't speak, who don't speak Spanish will be inspired to learn it as quickly as possible. Uh, but I'm not saying that you need to go to his sources, just that what he's saying to you is, this isn't something I made up. I have historical sources for this, even as I'm fictionalizing or, let's say, poeticizing aestheticizing the material. So 
that I probably should have said before we started talking about Octavio Paz, but I do want you to be aware of this book. How many people have the copy now, have the Genesis? Oh, that's very reassuring. So the bookstore did okay for us, I think, probably. Good. And those of you who don't, you have it on order or you just haven't gotten, gotten there yet. Okay, very good. All right, you, now we could look at my blackboard for a minute here so that we can follow what I consider to be the nature of the argument. We're going to ask first what Octavio Paz defines as culture. He tells us right at the outset. He says something about civilization, then he says something about culture. So we're going to look at that, and then I take this essay to be in about six major points, and I've outlined them, and I hope that sometimes when you're reading not so much fiction like Galeano or like Garcia Marquez, but when you're reading about fiction that you start to outline in this fashion. Bullet points, if you want. Um, first, he's going to talk about the differences between Mexico and the U.S. in terms of the indigenous peoples that occupied those territories. We're going to hear what he has to say about the nomadic groups in the north versus the settled groups in Mexico. Then we go to the imperial projects. I should have said here of Spain and of England. The difference between the imperial projects, what does he mean, what do I mean by imperial project? What I mean, and he doesn't use the phrase exactly, but he certainly uses the word empire and imperialist, what he means is the intention of England with the Puritans who came in 1620, as we know from our date sheet of last time, as opposed to the Spanish Catholic intentions when they came, say, let's take Columbus or Cortes, when Cortes defeated the Aztecs at Tenochtitlan in 1521, 99 years before the pilgrims landed. The Spaniards wanted one thing and the English wanted another, and he's very clear on that. We're going to see it. I've got my subpoints under there. The Catholics are centrist, the Protestants are pluralist. He says Mexico was a state before it was a nation and vice versa. He's setting up a whole series of oppositions. We can question those. We can say, now, wait a minute. It's not that black and white, and we're going to do that. But let's follow his argument first. Okay, so that's the different imperial projects which have everything to do with religion, Catholic and Protestant. I should have put that probably before anything under point two, Catholic versus Protestant. He's finding them very different, as indeed they are in terms of affecting the behavior of the colonizing process. Then number three, idols versus images. We're going to look at Catholic practice versus Protestant practice one more time. You can't understand the Americas if you don't understand religion and the part religion played both in the north and the south and in the middle. So idols is one thing and images is another. We're going to check out what he says on page 368. Then I can add some page numbers here. Um, well, it's, it's not so important, but um, let's go ahead. Rationalism versus dogmatism happens to be 369. Oh, wrong pen. Ah. 369. Past versus future, 370. It's all very clearly laid out. This was a New Yorker article, a magazine article. This wasn't uh, something that wasn't intended for a general audience. And then finally, the question we're always going to ask of our authors, what is history for these authors? What is the past? How do we know it? How do we write about it? How can we, how can we speak consensually? Because I can tell you whatever I want about my own past, and you can say, well, that's your own past, and you know that better than I. But when I say our past, or when I say the past of the Americas, of Latin America, then I've got to be depending on agreement, on consensus. And there's always going to be disagreement, but my example on this issue of consensual history is the Holocaust. There are people who deny that the Holocaust existed. Now, if we were to say, well, you know, history is how it's told. That's all it is, how it's told. So if you tell it and the Holocaust doesn't exist for you, well, it must not exist. No, we have to say most people agree that the Holocaust existed. And why people deny that, well, that's a whole other course, a whole other question. Um, obviously, there are, there are a million readings of the past, but the ones that tend to be... Uh, 
tend to be important, let's say, are those upon which a number of people can agree. So this issue of consensual history, or the history of, of a community agreed upon by a community is, is what I'm asking about Pass here at the end. What does he, how does he take our definition of history, how does he arrive at his, and so forth. Okay, let's start point number one, and please do interrupt, ask questions. Are there, are there concerns or questions at this point? Please feel free. Yes, would you push your button? <laughs> Thank you. Um, what was number six? Oh, sorry, we got uh, number six is conclusion. Thank you. Would you, would you tell me your name? Amanda. Amanda, I start to try to learn names. Um, Thank you. Conclusion, two uh, exclamation points, because I think you, you're going to see that this is a very polemical essay, that Pass has something very specific in mind, and it's to call the readers of The New Yorker in 1979 to attention, to say something about Mexico's disregard for American policy, for American blindness toward others. So. What we're going to see in the end is that Paz's version of history is in part Paz's version of history. We may not want to agree with that. What we're going to see is his position. Okay, number one, the nature of indigenous groups. Let's just, uh, I didn't mark the pages, but it's, it's really very early on. Well, first, the definition of culture. Um, he starts on 257, as you know, the first page of the essay, to say that we are two distinct versions of Western culture or of Western civilization, as he puts it. So he has, in a way, any writer would, to have to say a little bit more. When you make a declaration like that, you're going to have to define what you mean a little bit more. If you go to the bottom of 358, let's start that essay, uh, that paragraph, rather. Of course, the differences between Mexico and the United States are not imaginary projections, but objective realities. There are very real differences. Some are quantitative and can be explained by the social, economic, and historical development of the two countries. Are you there? Everybody there? Mm -hmm. If you didn't bring the essay, please look on. We're going to read from it quite a lot. It is the second page, 358. Do you have page numbers? Yeah. But they're different. But they're different. Is everybody else's page different than, or just? Does every, does, do people's texts have a page 358? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yours is something else. I couldn't access it on, on Okay. Just figure it's the second page. I'll try to give you indication. It's about the fourth paragraph of the essay, fifth. Of course, the differences, you see it? Okay, great. Of course, the differences between Mexico and the United States are not imaginary projection, but, uh, projections, but objective realities. Some are quantitative and can be explained by the social, economic, and historical development of the two countries. So far, you could say that about any two countries, okay? They're, they're different, okay? The more permanent ones, although though also the result of history, are not easily definable or measurable. The more permanent differences. I have pointed out that they belong to, that, to the realm of civilization, that fluid zone of imprecise, imprecise contours in which are fused and confused ideas, beliefs, institutions, technologies, styles, morals, fashions, church, the material culture and the evasive reality, which we rather inaccurately call le génie des peuples, a French phrase from a 19th century historian, meaning the, a national character or a cultural character. So what he's saying here already is let's not get so much into the dates and the times and the places and the leaderships and the constitutions and the revolutions. Let's talk about the way people live. Hmm? He's not, he's going to get back to that, and I put it, um, it's, uh, page 366, 369, he's going to talk about the attitudes toward death, toward festivals, toward the human body. We weren't going to go there right yet, but I want, you to, I want you to notice how he isn't forgetting his promise to the reader, and you shouldn't when you write essays either. If you bring something up, you're going to have... Don't bring it up if you're not going to get into it. So he first he brings up civilization, then he gives us a whole laundry list of what he means by that. It's the way people live, a character of a community. 
And we say, oh, the French are always like that, the Americans, the Mexicans. It's a very false statement. Of course, there are every sort of Frenchman and every sort of French woman and German and so forth. But nonetheless, if I said, you know, something about Germany, something about France, something about the U.S., we might sort of agree. And that's what he's going to start doing now. He's going to start giving us generalizations about Mexico, both its past and its present. But here he really wants to say, it's about the people that I want to talk and about how they live and how they die. So he does that, but we get into the meat of his argument, which is historical, uh, on page 359, which is next page along, um, and 60. It's the, S, it's the paragraph that begins, clearly the opposition between Mexico and the U.S. belongs to the North-South duality. Do you find that paragraph? Good. Um, go down a couple sentences, and we're going to get his first distinction. The U.S. is based in an indigenous culture that is, is nomadic. It's not agriculture. Already we can say he's talking about Massachusetts. He's talking about the eastern seaboard, the northeastern seaboard. He's talking about the plains. He's talking about North Texas, the Comanches, the Kiowas, and so forth. He's not talking about the southeast, where the, where the Cherokees were settled group, the Caddo's. He's not talking about the Pueblo Indians. He's talking about the early settlement and therefore the politicization, if you want, or the establishment of the polity of the U.S. And he says, you know, the, the settlers, the colonizers, the conquerors and then the colonizers found two different things. Nomadic, look at the very bottom, bottom sentence of 359. I will read it. Why should I paraphrase it? The northern part of the continent was settled by nomadic warrior nations. Mesoamerica, on the other hand, was the home of an agricultural civilization with complex social and political institutions dominated by warlike theocracies that invented and refined in, invented, invented, refined and cruel rituals. We'll see about the practice of sacrifice when we get to uh, Carlos Fuentes' book, The Buried Mirror. They invented refined and cruel rituals. cosmogonies, cosmic theories. They were huge astronomers. The Aztecs, the Mayas, the calendars, the calculations. Inspired by a very original vision of time. The great opposition of pre-Columbian America, all that now includes the United States and Mexico, was between different ways of life, nomads and settled peoples, hunters and farmers. This division greatly influenced the later development of the United States and Mexico. In the U.S., our indigenous past is fairly, unless you come from New Mexico, unless it's your special case, it's, it's quite invisible. In Mexico, it's absolutely visible. So this division greatly influenced the later development of the United States and Mexico. The policies of the English and the Spanish toward the Indians were in large part determined by this division. It was not insignificant that the former, the English, established themselves in a territory of the nomads, and the latter, the Spanish, in the, settle, in the area of settled peoples. Okay, I'm going to just go to one, I want you to look one more, at one more page where he's talking about this difference of indigenous groups. If you'll just turn the page to, um, to 362, it, it's the paragraph that begins, in the United States, the Indian element did not appear, the middle of 362. This, in my opinion, let's start it again. In the United States, the Indian element does not appear. Now, again, we can say, wait a minute, you haven't been to Santa Fe lately, or wait a minute, in South Dakota, where my dad and I began to grow up, there was a Rosebud Bud Reservation right there in Iowa, the Tama Reservation. I'm beginning in the Midwest. There was certainly reservations. We'd go and by beaded things, you know, <laughs> but it only proving Pass's point, I'm afraid. Though he's really still remember speaking about the Eastern U.S. at the time of the settlement of the of the time of the invention of the U.S. Really, in the United States, and of course, partly that is because obviously Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, 
Colorado were still Mexican until 1848. So he's talking about that, that earlier period. In the U.S., the, in the United States, the Indian element does not appear. This, in my opinion, is the major difference between our two countries. He says it twice. The Indians who were not exterminated in the U.S., were corralled in reservations. The Christian horror of fallen nature extended to the natives of America. The U.S. was founded on a land without a past. The historical memories, memory of Americans, meaning of the U.S., is European, not American. For this reason, one of the most powerful and most persistent themes in American literature, from Whitman to William Carlos Williams and from Melville to Faulkner, has been the search for or invention of American roots, and so forth. Keep going. I just want to come to one very beautiful sentence, I think, and very true sentence at the bottom of page 362. But start the next paragraph. We'll start it, and we'll get to that sentence. Exactly the opposite is true in Mexico, land of superimposed pasts. Mexico City was built on the ruins of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city that was built in the likeness of Tula, the Toltec city that was built in the likeness of Teotihuacan, the first great American, the first great city on the American continent, pre-Hispanic, pre of course, indigenous huge ceremonial centers. If you've been to Chichen Itza or Uxmal or, or Teotihuacan outside of Mexico City, you'll know. Then the sentence I'm headed for. Every Mexican bears within him this continuity which goes back 2,000 years. It doesn't matter that this presence is almost always unconscious and assumes the naive form of legend and even superstition. It is not something known, but something lived. That's the sentence I love. It's not something known, but something lived. That's, we could say that about culture generally. I mean, our own culture. We live it. We don't stop and think, gee, it's odd that I get to wear pants in front of a class. I remember first of all, when there weren't many women teachers, and secondly, when we weren't supposed to wear pants except when we were out on the playing field. That shows how old I am. But we take some of these things for granted. So I love that sense it's not something known, but something lived. We can say that about a great number of things with respect to our own cultures. Yeah. Tell me your name again, please. Julie. Julie. Um, I was wondering, this sentence, um, is he speaking about the past is not something no, known? No, he's speaking, people? the question is, is he speaking about the past that's not known? The answer, no, no, he's speaking about the indigenous inheritance. He's saying that if you go to a Mexican on the street in Mexico City and say, are you related to Moctezuma? I think this has changed since 1979. I think there's a huge awareness now in Mexico of indigenous pasts. There's been enormous recovery of indigenous sites. The anthropology and archaeology in Mexico can't be beat. If anybody wants to be an anthropologist or archaeologist, go straight to Mexico. It's beautiful, uh, beautifully des developed disciplines because of the richness of the territory. Thank you for asking. I hope that's clear. The Indian, maybe it's because we stopped there, one more sentence or two. The Indian presence means that one of the facets of Mexican culture is not Western. Is there anything like this in the United States? Each of the ethnic groups makes up a multiracial democracy that is the United, that is the United States. Mm. Sorry, I'm going to start again. Each of the ethnic groups making up the multiracial democracy that is the United States has its own culture and tradition, and some of them, the Chinese and Japanese, for example, are not Western. These traditionists, traditions exist alongside the dominant American tradition without becoming one with it. That's the pluralist culture we're going to get to in a minute. They are foreign bodies within American culture. Again, I think this has changed since 1979. I think we're much more multicultural in a sense of the mainstream. We don't, we really can't, I think, so much speak of an American mainstream, meaning Anglo-American Protestant mainstream. But I think in 79, that was less clear than it is now. To, in any case, his argument is that Mexico is a mixed culture, and the U.S. isn't. Okay, now why is that? He's going to go straight now to religion, and let's go to that. It's the, um, really the, the second point. We're only there. Would you go back to page 360? It's going to be about the fourth page of the essay. It's the, 
he's taken us from the end in the difference of nomadic and settled and I wanted to look at that more I wanted to look at his final assertion that every Mexico knows doesn't necessarily know but lives the indigenous past now there's a traditionalist for you that's going to that's going to be different from from what I mean if we were writing a history of the U.S., we'd probably start with 1776, or if we were colonialists, we would start with the pilgrims. There, there's, of course, there's, there are studies of indigenous cultures, but it's not exactly where we would, most of us would begin. So Octavio Paz is making his own point here by saying, look, we, no, we live the indigenous tradition in Mexico. And if you've been to Mexico, or if you are a Mexican, or a Mexican descent, you know that that's the case. Okay, now he's going to say why He's, he's asserted, for example, that the English did well to choose the nomadic populations and the Spaniards wanted... I wonder why that would be. Well, he tells us. Look at the middle of page 360. We're going the middle, the middle paragraph. It ends with the assertion, in England the Reformation triumphed, whereas Spain was the champion of the counter-reformation. Now we talked about that yesterday or day before in class and we talked about Henry VIII and why England became then Protestant and what that meant. And in the meantime, the south of Europe, Spain leading the way is championing Catholic Church as the one true church fighting religious wars against the Protestants, ultimately saying, well, the world will be divided, but only only after battles on the Turkish front and so forth, uh, not only in America. So let's, let's think about the difference then. He's going to give it to us uh, very clearly. I think if we go to 363, we're best off. That's the middle of the page. It's the paragraph that begins, if the different attitudes of Hispanic Catholicism and English Protestantism could be summed up in two words. Do you find it? 363, everybody there? I would say, and this is, this I want you to think about. He says, if the differences could be summed up, it is, I would say, that the Spanish attitude is inclusive and the English attitude is exclusive. In the former, the Spanish, the notions of conquest and domination are bound up with ideas of conversion and assimilation. In the latter, the Protestant, conquest and domination imply not the conversion of the conquered, but their segregation. Why is that? Anybody want to think about that out loud? Why would, why would the Protestants not be interested in converting indigenous peoples? Why would they just say, you know, they're kind of out of sight, out of mind until we want their land and then we'll put them on reservations and we'll keep pushing them west until pretty soon uh, everybody's on a reservation. Why would, the Pro why would Protestants have no interest in converting? Yeah, would you press the button? Remind me of your name, please. I don't know if you'll be able to hear me because it's like, oh, it moves. It's supposed to, yeah, it moves and it has a little green light. <laughs> oh, my name is Kirsna. Yeah. And I was just uh, wondering, maybe that they thought that they were so far gone in the beginning that they didn't even want to convert them because like, you know, like you were saying, the indigenous people, well, the Indians in America, were pro they were their own, their nature was everything to them. And with Protestants, it's not so much like that. So maybe they thought that they were inconvertible, like they couldn't be converted, so we'll just push yeah. them. Yeah, um, yes. Your name, please? Uh, Jenny. I'll ask you several times. Thank you, Jenny. I'll forget uh, immediately. I would think that it would have to do with the fact that when they came here, they were fleeing from religious persecution, and maybe they were just like, we have our religion, and you have your religion, and we don't need to convert you, because that's what we were trying to get away from. Yeah. It's called pluralism. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know much about mm -hmm. Protestantism, but uh, I don't know if they believe in predestination or not, because if if they do, then that would mean that, you know, the Protestants are the saved and chosen and predestined people. Yeah. Yeah. You know that that conversion isn't possible. You're just born a, a person of God or 
you're not. Right. Yeah, it, predestination is, as you know, a part of especially Calvinism, not all Protestantism. But there is some idea. That doesn't mean, though, that Protestants didn't, some of them, work with indigenous peoples. And it doesn't mean that they weren't constantly examining their soul, because they couldn't tell who was predestined to be saved and who was not. But I think I think that um, we're getting close to it when we, we remember the, that the Protestants are themselves persecuted people. It's not that they don't want to continue persecuting. They're perfectly happy to be very cruel to indigenous peoples. But it is that they believe that if you don't agree with them, you just go form another religion. That's why we have so many Protestant groups. Yeah. Would you tell me your name? Name's Annie. Um, Sorry? Annie. Annie, hi. I'm thinking of one of the big reasons why a lot of them would not want to go about the task of converting um, whoever they ran into is a, a fear of like uh, contamination, so to speak. Yeah, um, they're called Puritans They don't want to be yeah. part of that. They don't want you know their kids seeing something else and even contemplating that as another option. Yeah. Not to say that for all of the Puritans and all of the other Protestant groups that came over that that would be a reason, but a lot of them would see it as a threat and not want to entertain the idea. Mm -hmm of coexisting with that. Yeah, the, the communities were very closed, as he, as Poss points out, the Protestant communities. But it, it is theologically unnecessary to convert if you don't believe that there is one true church, that there are many ways to go about worshiping. And indeed, if you've left the church that's arguing that it's the one true church, then you don't need to include everybody. You can be exclusive. And that's what, he, what Octavio Paz says. So pluralism, which we're very proud of, at least I am, as, a, as an, a U.S. citizen, I'm very glad that I have the right to choose this ch church or that church, or indeed this school or that school, or indeed think about this way or that way. And what all I can say to the person who disagrees or chooses another option is, well, that's your right, because we're a pluralist culture. I don't have to convince you. We don't have to cohabit because we have lots of options. So what happens when there's the first disagreement in the Northeast, or at least a disagreement, with the pilgrims who landed in 1620, as you remember, on Plymouth Rock, with, with uh, Roger Williams, He's, he doesn't agree with the leadership. He says, fine, I'll just go found R Rhode Island. And he does. And then there are diff the different colonies. All why is the opposite true? Why does the Catholic Church have a great interest in conversion? Because it's the one true church. If, if you come as a Catholic conqueror, you are obliged to save souls. Now, we can say it's a pretty funny way to save souls, working indigenous groups to, get, to death in mines, doing terrible, terrible things, including bringing smallpox and measles. Um, if, if, if they really cared about those souls, maybe they'd leave them alone. No, no, they're heathens. We have to, to save them. So the Spanish conquest is based on and justified by the need to convert. These people are waiting for God's word. Indeed, there's a great discussion about who these indigenous peoples could be because they aren't contemplated in the Bible. There's the theory that's quite important in the 16th century that this, these are the lost tribes of Israel that are discussed in, in the uh, Hebrew Bible. So the Catholic Church had always to fit things into the dogma. We talked about it with Galileo, how Galileo is imprisoned because what he's discovered doesn't fit into the version. Uh, and we talked about it with the map. So the Catholics actually, and Octavio Paz says it in another essay, he says, you'll laugh, he says, you'll laugh when I say this. But in Mexico, we were better to our indigenous peoples than the English were in the north because we didn't kick them out of the cosmos. Now that's, in other words, we had to include them. So that's the difference between exclusive and inclusive, and it's the difference between centrist system and a pluralist system. The Catholic Church had, had to get used in the 16th century to the Protestant Reformation. People were saying, wait, we are not going to be a part of this church. And they used to be a part. So the whole examination of conscience and so forth comes, comes in. The whole idea of questioning what church, if you were a European, you would belong to, 
was new in the 16th century with Martin Luther, with Calvin, and so forth. So there, so these very different ways of looking at indigenous peoples are theologically determined. And every reason that you all have given, I think, are, are good ones. The, the Puritans weren't interested in mixing. The, you read Puritan literature. You should hear what they call the Indians, howling barbarians, da-da-da. It's <laughs> not pretty. Um, it's not pretty either the treatment of indigenous peoples in Latin America, but the fact is there were great groups of Catholic friars, Franciscans, Augustinians, Mercedarians, Mer Mercedary fathers, I think Mercedarios, who came later the Carmelites, later the Jesuits, all with this great interest. And we can say, well, it wasn't just their souls, it was their labor, it was their eventually the power that they had over great groups of people, these, these um, Catholic orders. But the fact is there was also a very deep religious and theological basis. You can feel it in Mexico today when you go, the difference. I mean, both cultures are admirable, the pluralist and the centrist. They've produced very different versions of Western culture, as Paz starts by saying. So this centrist versus pluralist, which I wrote on our little blackboard, uh, is, is, is something I want you to reread when you um, when you have a chance with Octavio Paz, pages 363. He, he defines them at the bottom. Let's just review his version after I've gone through it. It's that same paragraph where we were, the middle of 363. If the different attitudes of Hispanic Catholicism and English Protestant could be summed up in two words, I would say that the Spanish attitude is inclusive and the English is exclusive. In the former, the Spanish, the notions of conquest and domination are bound up justified by, I would say. These conquerors came over and they couldn't do what they did without saying, but we're saving souls. So there's a phrase, the spiritual conquest of Latin America, which is useful here. So it's bound up with ideas of conversion and assimilation. The latter, the English, conquest and domination imply not the conversion of the conquered, but their segregation, right? This is what I mean by imperial project. The two imperial projects or plans or intentions, you can use the word you want, are being compared here. Or I should say, being contrasted here. Okay, then he's gonna give us his definition one after the other of the pluralist and the centrist, which he's calling inclusive and exclusive. I should do it, do it the opposite way. The inclusive is centrist. Okay, an, in, an inclusive society, one that believes there's only one way to do things. You've got to include the other or others if you want everybody to agree with you. You have to find a way to make them fit, right? An inclusive society, Spanish, founded on the double principle of domination and conversion is bound to be hierarchical, centralist, and respectful of the individual characteristics of each group. Well, if respectful is taking is a little too celebratory, but anyway. It believes in the strict division of classes and groups, each one governed by special laws and statutes, but all embracing the same faith and obeying the same Lord. That's the Catholic Hispanic project. Now we're going to go to the Protestant English project. And in an exclusive society is bound to cut itself off from the natives either by physical exclusion or by extermination. At the same time, since each community of pure-minded men is isolated from other communities, it tends to treat its members as equals and to assume autonomy and freedom of each group of believers. So we can have the Lutherans and we can have the Methodists and we can have the Baptists and so forth. The origins of American democracy are religious. And in the early communities of New England, that dual contradictory tension between freedom and equality, which has been the light, mo light motif of history of the United States, was already present. Okay, so then he goes on to make the point that Annie was making about communion and purity. Those would be... Communion would be the centrist, inclusive model. Purity would be the Protestant, pluralist model. And it wouldn't have to be purity. It could just be, look, I, I differ from you. I'm going to go start Rhode Island. 
And we say, what a, what a great thing that is, that we can have different side by side. I mean, pluralism is, is, is admirable. <coughs> so is centralism, if not used um, indiscriminately. Okay, we, we're going to move on to the next, well, the state and nation issue. Do you, somebody define for me what he means by state and by nation. Would you, we're tired of hearing the sound of my voice, it's page 367 and 368. It's the very bottom of 367. If you're looking for it in a different pagination, it's the paragraph, there's a typographic break. If you find that, it's the next paragraph down. Pre-Columbian Mexico was a mosaic of nations, tribes, and languages. Anybody dare to talk about that? Let's read what he has to say and then let somebody analyze it for us. Unless some, I have a volunteer. Okay, let's read what he's saying. Again, he's doing this dichotomy. He's saying one is one way, the U.S. is one way, and Mexico is the opposite way. And he's, here's what he says. It's three lines up from the bottom of 367. The true effective unity of Mexican society was brought about was, has been brought about slowly over several centuries, but its political and religious unity was decreed from above as the joint expression of the Catholic monarchy and the Catholic church. Okay. Mexico had a state and a church before it was a nation. In this respect also, Mexico's evolution has been very different from that of the United States, where the small colonial communities had from their inception a clear-cut and belligerent concept of their identity as regards the state. For North Americans, the nation antedated the state. Would somebody explain that to us, please? It's quite clear, don't you think? What's nation? For him. Nation, doesn't it mean a, a, an agreed upon community? And doesn't state mean the state apparatus? Who governs the governor, the viceroy, the king? He's saying from the very beginning, New Spain, which became Mexico in 1821 when it became independent from Spain, but New Spain was decreed a unit. A unit. It's going to be Catholic. It's going to be run by the King of Spain, whom we remember as Charles, Charles V, 1521. It's not quite that early, but whereas he says, look, in the, in the U.S., there were these little dissident groups of religious folks who, had, who weren't going to let the state mess with them. They knew who they were. They were a nation before they were a state. The state comes in 1776 or somewhat thereafter. So again, this dichotomy, this very starkly drawn difference between the U.S. and Mexico. Mexico it was imposed from, a, the state was imposed, and over time the nation evolves, whereas the opposite is true of the U.S. The state comes out of the communities, the colonies, that had a clear sense of their own if not national, at least their own communal identity. Is one better than the other? I don't think he's, he's asking that question here. Let's keep on going. The idols versus images, the third point on my list, is the bottom of 368. And I'm going to just go ahead and we'll forge on here. No less profound difference. You're going to end up finding out that he doesn't think there are many similarities at all. I'm going to propose some similarities myself. But, um, it's, it's a, again, this e either or, either or, either or structure. Mm -hmm. A no less profound difference was the opposition between Catholic or Orthodoxy and Protestant reformism. We've already talked about this a bit. In Mexico, Catholic Orthodoxy. Now, what does he mean by Orthodoxy? He means the rules of the religion. Everybody's busy obeying the dogma. It's dogmatic. We use dogmatic as a negative term, but that says something about our non-dogmatic culture. Dogmatic doesn't have to be negative. It means you follow the rules, orthodoxy. You follow the rules. 
versus Protestant reformism, you know, fighting against the rules. In Mexico, Catholic Orthodoxy had the philosophical form of Neo-Thomism. Anybody want to write on that? I'd love it. I can help you with that. St. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, is the basis of uh, the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Counter-Reformation. A mode of thought more apologetic than critical. Apologetic not in the sense of saying you're sorry, in the sense of an apology as a speech, as a, as a statement of belief. More, more dogmatic than critical, we can say, and defensive in the face of, emerging, of an emerging modernity. Orthodoxy prevented examination and criticism. Now that's past criticizing Mexico very strongly and criticizing the Catholic Church. In New England, the communities were often made up of religious dissidents, people who were already mad, already said, I don't like it the way it is. I'm going to have a new world. That's why I'm here or at least of people who believe that the scriptures should be read freely. I think we'll stop there, but would you go on and read the next paragraph? I'll let you read it yourselves. It's a continuation of this difference he's making between Protestant reformism and Catholic orthodoxy. He's talking about rationalism, critical thought, wondering whether this is the way it should be as opposed to saying well this is the way it's written and this is the catholic position and i'm a catholic so here he becomes oddly look at the very bottom of 369 one line up there's a nice phrase he's in favor of rationalist thought he's clearly here anti-catholic at least <clears throat> with respect to Modernity, he says, look, it kept us back. This orthodoxy, this belief in tradition, it kept, it kept Mexico from modernizing and kept Spain from modernizing. Now, we can argue about that somewhat, but look, look actually about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines up from the bottom of 369. It's the paragraph that begins, if one considers the historical evolution of the two societies. That's, he's doing nothing but that. That's what he's doing. I want to start with that. The United States, if you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the sentence that begins the eighth line up on 369. It, the United States has, was born of the Reformation and the Enlightenment. It's true. Think of 1776. It's already end of the 18th century. The French Revolution is going to be 1789, the storming of the Bastille. There's all of this democratic movement. The U.S. is born way after the Hispanic world, 100 years at least. We don't even have to consider the pre-enlightenment. Think of Thomas Jefferson. Think of Benjamin with his kite and his key and all this. The founding fathers and a few mothers, I suppose, uh, of the U.S. were rationalists. They were deists. They weren't Catholic. They weren't even Puritan. By then, they sort of believed in a mechanical universe where there was a prime mover. That's what deism means. It means they weren't against a god, but they didn't think of God as a person, a personal relationship with God. It was a prime mover. He sets the world in motion, and like a clock, the world continues to tick. Those are our founding fathers. Ours, I say, the U.S. Uh, I hope ours. So let's let's start again. Eight lines up. The United States was born of the Reformation and the Enlightenment. And the Reformation here means saying no to Catholic orthodoxy. That Reformation thing is really important because it means Protestantism, it means pluralism, it means exclusion of indigenous peoples, all the stuff he's accruing meaning here, right? It came into being under the sign of criticism and self-criticism. Now when one talks of criticism, criticism one is talking of change. The transformation of critical philosophy into progressive ideology came about and reached its peak in the 19th century, the broom of rationalist criticism. Now that's a funny phrase, that's the one I was headed for, the broom of rationalist, sweeping away the old notions and so forth. Um, but it's a kind of critical phrase too, look how he does it. The broom of rationalist criticism swept the ideological sky clean of myths and beliefs. The ideology of progress in its turn displaced the timeless values of Christianity 
and pretty soon the U.S. is only given over to material stuff. That's what he's going to say. He's going to say this broom of rationalist criticism got rid of the past, got rid of the traditions in ways that make us secular, make the, the U.S. a secular culture, always ready to leap into the future, as he says in the middle of the next paragraph. And that is my second, my fifth point, and I think his. He's looking at history. He's, he's trying to figure out history, and what he's looking at it is a radically ahistorical culture, us. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you don't remember the past. You're critical, ref reforming, um, resistant position is great, but what it means is you're always getting rid of what came before. So there's an implied critique here, always ready to leap into the future. Don't read that as a great thing. For traditionalists like Paz, interested in history and interested in culture, which is a historical construction, how, how is that possible? Okay, You forget, he's starting to say to us, us US readers of his essay. Let's skip to the conclusion. And with my two um, exclamation points and see where he's been heading. So far, we can read his pro-Mexican stance. There's that moment, as I said, when he says, look, you know, this Catholic orthodoxy prevented us for a long time from moving into modernity. We just obeyed, we just, and so forth. So that he, he says, he says the Hispanic world never had an enlightenment. That's not true. Um, but the 18th century, as you know, in, in northern Europe is kind of, well, it's the consolidation of a great deal of science. It's consolidation of deism, as I said. Uh, he says, no, that wasn't the way it was in Spain and in the Spanish world. But we're going to see at the end that he's way more pro-Mexican than he is pro the U.S. I mean, when you set up a dichotomy and you find opposites all along, you won't be surprised that the guy finally, or the woman writing the essay, finally says, I prefer this to that. We can say, well, some of those oppositions are false. We've already looked at some of them. But in the end, he's going to whip the U.S. for being too pluralist, too futurist, too critical, if critical means getting rid of and reforming all of the time. So let's see what he says. It's page 374, the middle. The paragraph begins, the sickness of the West is moral rather than social and economic. Do you find it? It is true that the economic problems are serious and that they've not been solved. Inflation and employment are on the rise. Poverty has not disappeared despite affluence. Several groups, women and racial, religious and linguistic minorities still are or feel excluded, but the real most profound discord lies in the soul. Oh my goodness, here's the poet moving into the area of the soul. We can expect anything, um, but he's, he's not going to go too far with the soul. What he's going to do is cr critique American culture for being too powerful, too rich, too blind. And that's, that's his position. Uh, let's keep going. Skip to the, he goes on about how bad things are. He, he, go to the next paragraph. I will not continue. The evils of the West have been described often enough, most recently by Solzhenitsyn. I don't know if you've read Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, the great Russian novelist, still alive, I believe, very old, um, but things like Cancer Award, huge novels that critiqued the Russian, the Soviet system, he was imprisoned and so forth. He says a man of admirable character. However, although Solzhenitsyn's description seems to me accurate, his judgment of the causes of the sickness of Western society does not or does not, does not, nor does the remedy he proposes. His judgment nor the remedy aren't working. We cannot renounce the critical tradition of the West, nor can we return to the medieval theocratic state. Dungeons of the Inquisition are not an answer to the gulag camps where Solzhenitsyn spent time. It is not worthwhile substituting the church state for the party state. 
one orthodoxy for another. He says, we've got to remain critical. We've got, even though maybe too much, too much resistance, too much reformation sweeps the past away, we have to hang on to a critical sense. However, let's keep going. The only effective arm against orthodoxies is criticism. And in order to defend ourselves against the vices of intolerance and fanaticism, our only recourse is the exercise of the opposing virtues, tolerance and freedom of spirit. I do not disown Montesquieu, Hume, Kant. He's saying I, I belong to this Western critical tradition. But now, okay, so we aren't going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're going to remain. We're going to retain the critical often Protestant, sometimes Catholic, tradition of critical thought. But now let's look at the U.S., he says. Wait a minute. The crisis of the U.S. affects the very foundation of the nation, by which I mean the principles that founded it. He's saying the U.S. is in trouble. It's betrayed its own origins. I've already said that there is a light motif running through American history, a light motif, that same tune, that same theme running through American history from Puritan colonies of New England to the present day, namely the tension between freedom and equality. Okay, another of these tricky pairs, and we're going to see one more in a minute. Oh, I think we have to evacuate. I think that's what that means. See you next time. We'll finish this up. Have... Yeah. Go, go quick. See you Tuesday.